The topic for Pathwork Steps in November 2018 is Pathwork Lecture 136, The Illusory Fear of Self. I've divided into four sections. The first has negative chain reactions. Second as the big lie. Third, deciding to desire change will change your feelings. And fourth, overcoming self-deception and pretense. Lecture titles are sometimes very poetic. They contain very large ideas. And once you get the idea, you go back to the title and it, it resonates with some very complicated ideas. So the illusory fear of self uh, is partly explained as fearing yourself is an illusion. Fearing ourselves is, it's not real. There's nothing to fear. So if there's nothing to fear, why are so many good and decent people nervous about what's inside, what their feelings are about, uh, trying to control or, or mitigate their environment so that they're not upset or, or depressed or why are we trying to control things so much if we're not afraid of ourselves? And as many people will admit, there is a sense that we're not good enough, that we're not working hard enough, that there's something wrong with us. The guide is describing that as an illusion. It's disconnected from reality. What he's explaining is if you are afraid of something, let me back up a second. If I'm afraid of something, the easiest way to find out exactly what's going on and find what I can do about it is to go look at it, to examine it, to analyze it, to notice what the dynamics are, what the cause and effect are, and to make a change. The guide suggesting that same behavior for ourselves. The problem is that we're afraid of ourselves. We won't turn that vision inside. We won't look for what's wrong because we're terrified that it is equivalent to a judgment of ourselves. And that's why this is an illusion. We don't really know what we're talking about. We're afraid of something, but we don't know what it is. Very often in meetings and in sessions, I bring up a monster in the closet. Because that's what is meant by illusory fear of self. We're terrified, but we don't know what of, and therefore we can't do anything about it, except run away or look for remedies. Now, in the first section of this lecture, the guide talks about negative chain reactions, and that's what he speaks of. That running away or finding, trying to find remedies doesn't lead you to understand the problem. In other words, we're trying to find remedies before we actually know what we're trying to fix. So of course our remedies are not going to be effective because they're being applied ignorantly. Now in this negative chain reaction, we're constantly in motion and that in itself is a kind of remedy. What I mean by that is we feel better when we're moving, when we're shifting and changing and rearranging, buying new things, uh, moving around in life. It makes us feel alive. It makes us feel powerful. It allows us to exercise skills and talents, even if they're not related to the problem we're wanting to address. So it can be a distraction. And in this kind of dist uh, distraction, we're building a negative chain reaction because we're not connected to the real issue and we're putting things into motion that aren't connected to the real issue. And that makes us happy. So we continue to put those in motion and we're getting further and further and further away from being able to understand what the underlying issue might be. In Pathwork Lecture 196, <coughs> Commitment, Cause and Effect, 
the guide speaks of there can be a disconnect between cause and effect so that we only see the effect and the cause is is hidden it's covered up it's mysterious it's confusing uh, so we try to deal with the effect but if you deal with the effects the cause is still active it will simply produce more effects if you're lucky it will produce the same effect so that you'll notice that the the, the thing you tried to fix is still active so that you will go deeper. Sometimes the effects that it produces are different so that you don't connect the dots and you don't realize that there's a common underlying cause for different types of effects. Um, in the negative chain reactions, they're very similar to vicious circles, but chain reaction indicating that there's a, a constant movement uh, domino falling effect more so than just a, a cycling back around that things get worse that's what chain reaction is meant to imply um, so one of the uh, tools that I have found in the Patrick lectures and I, I'm not very good for quoting uh, which lecture I get these things from it's scattered it's phrased uh, in 10, 20 different lectures, it's phrased different ways. And we, we do have our favorite uh, way of saying something. But what I've reduced this to is an ability to stop being scared of what's going on, to force myself to stand still and relax and look around me to see what's going on. And the phrase I use is, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be, doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. That doesn't mean I'm right. That doesn't even mean I'm honorable or ethical. It means stand where you are, breathe, see what got you here, decide if this is where you want to be, and if it isn't, let's do something about it. Let's change one of the dynamics that got you here and then you move forward a little bit and then say the same thing I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing meaning I need to see the effect of a this is a standard phrase false belief misconception or distortion something in my belief system something in my understanding got me here I believed something that wasn't true. So I need to change that. But the impetus to change it is actually being in the wrong place. So I haven't made a mistake. I'm not a bad person. I'm the result of my belief system. And for me to be in a different space, I need to address that belief system. I need to find out where the untruth is in it doesn't mean all of what I believe is not true, but something's not right if I'm in a position that I don't want to be in. The question is, how did I get there? So the phrase, I'm gonna repeat it one more time. I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be, doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing, is meant to bring to me a sense that I need to learn something, I need to see something. So being in an uncomfortable, hostile, frightening place there's an opportunity in that to say but i don't want to be here so i need to understand how i got here what that does is it stops my rolling fear it stops me from focusing on i'm bad i'm wrong i'm not caring enough and trying to constantly search for remedies so if i stop and i say let's say i'm not good enough well, number one, who says so? Number two, good enough for what? Number three, what scale am I using? What, what, where, where's the ruler that says you should be here and you're here? If you think about it, if you do some honest work, you'll realize that these are all subjective realities that we have picked up from our caretakers, from our parents, from our childhood, from our friends and family and community. 
And just because a lot of people believe in something doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean it's ethical. It doesn't mean that it's true. It just means that it's a common belief system. It may work 90% of the time, which is a pretty good average. But you may be experiencing the 10% of the time where it doesn't work. That belief doesn't accommodate a certain given situation or need. To be ethical means you have to risk doing something differently, which may, for a few moments, make you feel isolated or separate from other people. But again, what is your goal? To be with people or to be ethical and draw new crowds of people that believe more closely in how you want to live your life than a group that you've been associated with has believed? little wordy, but what I'm trying to explain is a way to stop the chain reaction, to stop running and ask, what am I running from? And to turn around and face it and say, is there a tiger chasing me? Um, the second section of this lecture talks about the big lie and splits it into two pieces. One is that there is an illusion that is based on duality, meaning that we perceive a good choice and therefore there's a bad choice. <clears throat> or we have a bad choice, we visualize a bad choice, and therefore there must be a good choice. <coughs> Every single time I do these presentations, lately I cough. I apologize, it's rude, I'm not a professional. And I'm coughing again. <clears throat> so, there's an illusion of duality. That there's a good choice or a bad choice. Whenever there is a good versus bad choice, we're always going to go for the good choice. Now, that's subjective. It's based on our ideas of good. But what this does is it perpetuates duality. It perpetuates a two-choice system so that we focus on the good against the bad. So before I was talking about running away from something, um, the lecture on unity and duality, Pathwork Lecture 143, the main one, uh, presents, a, 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 presents a picture where we are always wanting to live and be good and be right and be honorable and be loved, that's all good. And so we're always running away from its opposite. But if that is occasionally an illusion, then we're running away from an illusion. We're disconnected from reality. And as I said before, if you're disconnected from reality, you're basically in ignorance and your solutions are not going to work against an illusionary problem. Same thing if you reverse that. If you have an illusion of something that is good, and you're reaching for it, you're still reaching in ignorance for something that doesn't actually exist. So the two parts of the big lie is number one, there's an illusion that there's good or bad choices. And secondly, that illusion will eventually create confusion. The third part is one of the reasons I chose this lecture. And it says, we are not a victim of our feelings. And the guide even says so many times we say, but I feel that way. As if that's an excuse for the next actions that follow. And the guide suggests we are not prisoners of our feelings. We are not victims. The fact that I feel a certain way is not the end of the story. I have the opportunity to desire to feel differently. Now, for adults, we think that we're talking about very serious topics and we're very intelligent, we're very forthright. And so it's easier if we reframe this in terms of when we were children. So when we are children and we shout, but I feel this way, it is the adult's job to show us that it isn't necessary 
to feel that way. To help us relax and see that there are several choices. We don't need to be afraid of those choices, but we can take our time. There's no, often there's no deadline. Often there's no judgment, but there's a fear of judgment. <clears throat> so when we teach young children to manage their feelings, this is where the guide is speaking to adults, saying you need to manage your feelings. And by managing your feelings, you can literally desire, which sounds like a feeling, you can desire to feel differently and change your feelings. Now, we've all experienced changing habits. If you think of a habit as I desire this soda pop, I desire this piece of candy. If we think of that as a feeling, are we simply prisoners of that desire? Or as responsible adults, do we have ways and tools and the desire to change the desire? So the lecture uh, challenges us to not give in to simply feeling. Just because you feel scared doesn't mean there's something to be scared of. Just because you feel uh, a lack of something does not mean you lack it. It means you feel a lack. There's a difference. We can feel differently about the same thing with a relatively small amount of effort. But if we're afraid of anything, then we're not going to look at it. So we're looping it back, back around to the first topic, which is we need to face what we're frightened of. We need to talk about it, examine it, put it out in the fresh air, take a look at it, kick it around a little bit, and see what it's really about before we spend a lot of time and effort trying to avoid the feeling or a situation that isn't as terrible as we imagine it is. So feelings can be changed. This section also talks about how life is a manifestation of our beliefs, which I mentioned earlier. And another version of this statement uh, in another lecture is that life does not lie. And what is meant by that is that where I am today is a culmination of my life. I am not a perfect person. I have vices. I can be selfish. I can be self-involved, uh, etc. The things in my life that work well, work well because they're founded on relatively ethical, uh, moral, truthful beliefs and principles. Aspects of my life that do not work well, the guide suggests are founded upon principles that have some sliver of untruth, unlovingness, unethical behavior, some aspect of spiritual law that I'm not fully willing to embrace. And that the disharmonious aspects of my life are the result of that. They don't come out of the blue. They're the result of that. Now again, it is very difficult to trace cause and effect back to see a direct line between the two. That's what lecture 196 is about. How difficult it is sometimes to connect cause and effect so that you can say this caused that but it is not as hard as you might believe it is. Once again, the trick is to start looking at it instead of just running away from it. So remembering that the title of this lecture is the illusory fear of self that makes us not look at ourselves. And the last section is overcoming self-deception and pretense. So you can see where that, that section is built on all the others. That we do deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves into thinking we can't do something. We deceive ourselves into thinking we're already um, at a higher plane of development than we are. And what that does is prevent us from looking too closely at our mistakes or our disharmonies or areas that need our attention because we should not have to look at that. We're already more advanced than that. It's a form of pretense. One of the largest uh, 
types of pretense that the guide talks about is idealized self-image, which is Catholic Lecture 83. In the idealized self-image, we imagine who we want to be, which is a glorious thing. And it's a wonderful uh, spiritual reality that we can imagine being more advanced than we are. If you think about it, that alone is a, a magnificent ability. But we go a step further, and instead of only imagining who we could be, we think we're already there. And we help that along by pretending we're already there. So we not only think we're already there, we wholeheartedly pretend we're there. The dilemma is we're not there, and part of us knows it. Now, I mention a lot of lectures when I do groups and when I do these uh, videos because um, I, I was just about to say anybody can read a lecture, but what I meant by that is when we read one lecture, we get one aspect of what the guide's talking about. When you read 50 lectures, you get a more dynamic sense of the concept. So I point out other lectures uh, in case something interests you and you want to pursue it. There's a lot of lectures and I'm trying to help out and point out where a certain concept might be um, explained with more depth. And in this place with idealized self-image, which again is 83, there was a lecture a few uh, numbers before that, Patrick Lecture 77, that talks about self-confidence and how self-confidence is sapped because we suspect something's wrong. We suspect that we aren't who we think we are. We suspect that we are not as honorable as we imagine we are, that we want to be. And that suspicion holds us back. It, it makes us afraid to put ourselves forward. So both these lectures are related to this later one, 136, on illusory fear of self. Yes, there may be something about yourself that is in pretense, but that may be all it is. And pretense can be very easily addressed. You stop pretending. But to stop pretending means you need to admit where you are. And that's why the guide speaks so often about self-analysis, honesty. Uh, there's a phrase, scrupulous self-honesty. And I like the word because it, it automatic, poetically, uh, brings up the word scrub. So scrupulous self-honesty sounds like you've got to really scrub, to be honest. And there's truth in that. It's not easy. It's hard to do. It's easy to dodge the hard work of self-examination. It's easy to listen to other people instead of saying, well, what do I think about myself and other situations? I'll just rather go with the crowd than think about it. So honesty, uh, analysis, uh, looking for the disharmonies in our life, uh, digging them up so we can see them clearly and do something about them, it's hard work. But like any kind of work, once you have tasted the joy that results from not being eaten up from the inside by self-doubt, by worry, by these nagging suspicions that we are not as good as we thought we were, once you're not drained by those, uh, the experience of many people, my experience and, and people that I have worked with over the years, is that they have so much more energy that can be available to them that this self-doubt, this worry, uh, drains our energy and consumes more resources and more focus than you, than you may be able to imagine at this moment. So even though the work is hard, the results are joyous. They allow uh, an amazing sense of liberty and freedom, a willingness to put yourself forward, understanding it won't be perfect, like me doing these things and for the fourth time in a row having to drink water halfway through. I don't know what the spiritual significance of that is, 
except maybe people need to see that videos like this don't have to be um, professional production, uh, um, whatever. Okay. Sometimes it's important. Maybe that's why I start coughing and getting a dry mouth. It may also be due to the fact that it is not easy for me to make the videos. I have dodged them, I have delayed them, I, I avoid them, I keep thinking, but it's in the lecture, all you have to do is read it. And it is also true that it is helpful to hear different interpretations to help us come to our own. So I'm not trying to give you my interpretation, even if I could, which I cannot. Instead, I'm trying to offer uh, a human interpretation of the lecture. And it, when you read it, you'll have your interpretation of the lecture. And it is useful to hear other points of view and feel how you resonate with them. So my reluctance to do these is partly based on who am I to tell you about the lecture. And I have to keep remembering how useful it was for me to hear the explanations of others. As a matter of fact, one of the most useful things in my, uh, I studied formally for eight years in this, in path work plus a bunch of other disciplines. The worst teachers I had were some of the best learning experiences I had because it taught me to trust my own judgment and not be swayed by authority or even affection to an individual. I learned to realize that when I felt, um, when I started contracting from something, that there was something about that that I needed to look at. There was some truth in it. There may have been some defense in it. But again, some of the worst, you get a, uh, bell curve of teachers. You get excellent teachers and you get not excellent teachers. So if anything that I am saying rubs you the wrong way, voila, enjoy. Uh, because I may not be expressing what matters to you. But when we are exposed to what doesn't matter or what irritates or what confuses us, it can be an opportunity to then discover why that is so and to adjust and find what does feel right for us. So that's a spiritual version of win-win. Um, so I hope you read the lecture. The lecture is far better than anything I can describe. It is Patrick Lecture 136, The Illusory Fear of Self. And thanks for listening.